celebrating 40 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the number of Mississippi dairy farmers continues to fall. We'll have a breakdown of the numbers and hear an expert's take on why farmers continue to leave the industry. And who doesn't love a meal cooked on a cast iron skillet? But in order to extend the skillet's life, it's important to clean it the right way. The Food Factor will be here to show us how. Just in time for June, Gary Bachman will tell us how to make those flower beds pop with color. But here's the thing, you won't need flowers to do it. We'll explain. And don't be a tater hater. We're heading to the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge to see how the spuds damaged during the harvest don't go to waste. Farm Week starts right now. And, span. and I'm Troy Mullick. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. Hey, guess what? First Farm Week of a new month. We are into the month of June. How about that? Yeah, and the temperatures, they continue to warm up, and it's a busy time, of course, for Mississippi agriculture. Oh, yeah, it sure is. And uh, our first story today might be better suited for a place like Wisconsin, but if you look hard enough, you'll still find some dairy cows in Mississippi. I think, I think we got a couple out there, some dairy cows. That's our first story though, isn't it? That is correct, Troy. After all, Mississippi is always, always near the top for agricultural commodities like catfish, cotton, sweet potatoes. Meanwhile, the number of dairy cows, they continue to fall. In the first quarter of 2017, milk production was down 7% from the same time in 2016. Additionally, 39 million pounds of milk were collected in the first three months of the year. That compares to 42 million the first quarter of last year. Mississippi State University Extension livestock economist Josh Maples says the decline isn't unexpected. I think one of the biggest things is we've got fewer number of cattle in the uh, Mississippi than we had the previous year. So we're down about 500 head of dairy cattle uh, as compared to the first quarter of 2016. And so this has had a big impact on the amount of milk that we're, we've produced. Also following the value of Mississippi milk production. Last year's value was about $25 million. That's down from $32 million the previous year. One issue, the state's dairy farmer is getting older. Average age of the dairy farmer in Mississippi is about 55 years old. So we're getting to the point where these farmers are going to have to transition to the next generations if they're going to continue. Uh, and we're having trouble finding people to continue those traditions and continue those farms. All the while, milk prices remain low because nationwide production is up. Expected U.S. production this year is about 217 billion pounds. That's four and a half billion pounds more than 2016. Moving now from cows to cooking, cast iron is one of the most versatile pieces of cookware in the kitchen. It's durable, it cooks food evenly, and maintains heat. That's pretty cool, right? But the great debate these days is how to clean it. And in this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells you how to clean and season your cast iron properly. Cast iron cookware is perfect for whipping up a stir fry or even baking a fluffy frittata. But it's important before cooking to season your cookware. Proper seasoning is what gives cast iron its smooth, non-stick coating that makes cooking and cleanup a breeze. Here's how to season a cast iron skillet. Preheat the oven to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Wash the skillet with warm, soapy water. Rinse and thoroughly dry the skillet. With a paper towel, apply a thin coat of vegetable oil to the inside and the outside of the skillet. Place upside down on the oven center rack. Add a sheet of aluminum foil below to catch any drips and bake for an hour. Turn off the heat afterwards and allow the skillet to cool completely before removing it from the oven. 
And remember to add a light coating of oil each time you use your skillet to keep it in top condition. Contrary to popular belief, you can use soap and water to clean your cast iron cookware. Just don't soak the pan or leave it out to air dry because it will rust. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For some meal ideas to create in your cast iron skillet, be sure to visit the Food Factor Pinterest page at Mississippi State University Extension Service. Every gardener wants their flower beds to pop with color. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us how we can produce color without flowers. Many people feel the only way to get abundant color in your garden is to grow a lot of flowers. Today on Southern Gardening, we'll look at some eye-popping color produced without a single flower. If you want big plants, there are several options. Banana plants come in different sizes and colors, from bright greens to red stripes. Some varieties are cold tolerant and will survive our Mississippi winters. Stepping down in size are elephant ears. Of course, everyone is familiar with the big green leaf varieties, but there's plenty more. Black coral has large, glossy, chocolatey black leaves with fine ruffled edges. The large green leaves of Blue Hawaii feature prominent bluish purple veins. If you're only looking for bedding plants, then you have to try Sun Coleus. These plants come in a kaleidoscope of colors. Some offer largely solid colored leaves like electric lime and redhead, but I like the wildly variegated selections. Some of these varieties like Trusty Rusty, Fiesta Cherry, Kiwi Fruit, and Cranberry Salad create a delicious sounding carnival of color. And finally, don't forget the late season color of ornamental peppers. Purple Flash features both flashy foliage and pretty fruit. Other varieties like April Fool's Day features tangles of long pods that resemble a joker's hat. The biggest strength of all these plants is their outstanding color from late spring until frost in the fall. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. So yeah, Gary really makes a good point. Flowers, they're not the only way you can add some color to that garden. Lots of colorful plants out there for you and everybody else uh, watching right now for us to try. Yeah, you can really mix it up when you combine plants with flowers, using them both. Oh yeah, mix it up indeed. And uh, I guess you're gonna mix it up for us on the markets today, aren't you? Well, how about a new fast food item made with chicken? chicken like we grow in Mississippi. How about Good. a new like fast that. food item? You'll hear about that uh -huh. coming up in the markets. Also, seining picks up around the nation's catfish ponds. Feed input costs are key to the feeder cattle market, while July cotton futures are volatile. You'll find out why. Farm-raised catfish processing is picking up in the U.S. as spring winds down. A monthly report shows us that farm sales closed in on 26 million pounds round weight, that's an increase of 15% from the same time one year ago. Now, prices for producers, however, were not up, but basically flat compared to this time in 2016. But on the processor side, sales were up, up over 4.5%. Predicting feed input costs for livestock is not an easy thing to do, but the price of feed corn, a key input for feeder cattle, is going to hold sway over the feeder cattle market for the foreseeable future, this says trader Don Roos. A lot of the feeder cattle during the summer is going to be dependent on what happens with the corn market, the feed input costs. So, you know, watch the corn. If the corn uh, rally sharply, it's not going to be a positive for feeders. But, you know, I, I would watch that. But we think that uh, you were definitely at risk management opportunities when you're between 150 and 160 on feeder cattle. Downside, uh, you know, could still be in the 120s, 130s. Um, you know, it's still uh, a situation where the cattle market overall isn't that bullish. It's just that maybe the bearishness over the last few years is behind us. August feeder cattle were trading at 149.77 as of Wednesday morning. Well, before our trivia quiz, let me ask you another question. 
What do you get when you marinate and season a triangular shaped piece of white meat chicken, then fry it, then serve it with nacho cheese sauce? Well, a popular fast food chain calls it naked chicken chips. It's the newest creation from white meat chicken, Mississippi's number one ag commodity. The restaurant chain says the item is a cross between a chicken nugget and chips and dip. Now, the real question, today's trivia quiz. We zero in on horticulture and mix in just a little bit of history. Where did the oldest organized garden club in America start? Garden clubs have been a staple of the South and flourished most when most women did not work outside the home. Your possible answers, A, Natchez, B, Athens, Georgia, C, Mobile, or D, Charleston, South Carolina. We'll have the answer for you coming up. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, cotton futures have been anything but calm. Layton talks with Brian Williams to see what's ahead in the coming months. And you've heard the saying, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Well, what about an invention using sweet potatoes? We'll drop by the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. This is a carb load you won't want to miss. Stay with us. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Are you friends with Farm Week on Facebook? If not, you're missing out. Here at Farm Week, we want to hear from you. Got a question about agriculture? Our experts can help. Have a picture you want to share? Well, we'd love to see it, and there's even a chance it could show up on a future episode. So like us today and join in on the conversation. Now it's the time when we shine the light on what's happening with Mississippi State University Extension. This is an event master gardeners and horticulture enthusiasts won't want to miss. Here's your Extension Spotlight. Roses. They smell wonderful and look amazing in a garden or in a vase on a table. Well, now you can learn how to grow beautiful roses yourself. Head to the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Verona on June 7th. The fun starts at 10 a.m. Come and take a guided tour through the center's formal rose garden. Learn the names of different roses you can grow and hear from rose experts on proper management practices. For more information, contact your local MSU Extension office or call the number on your screen. Pre-registration is not required, and get this, the price is free! And that's this week's Extension Spotlight. Well, 83% of Mississippi's cotton crop is now planted as of last Sunday. Meanwhile, July cotton futures have been volatile, a result of a stronger U.S. dollar and some other factors. But as the July contract goes off the board, it looks like December futures could go up or down, depending on who you talk to. Well, what's the headline in the cotton market here at the end of May? Well, we've kind of got two things driving the market right now. Um, first of all, and, and one thing that's kind of making the news quite a bit is China's auctioning off uh, some of their stocks again. Uh, they were doing this a year ago, and it really last year didn't have too much of an impact on the markets. It looks like this year it's it's more of the same. Uh, but last week they just last week they offered auctioned off 125,000 uh, metric tons. So the other thing is our exports, and we're really watching where the export markets are are, are going right now. So there may be or is a problem as far as uh, cotton exports at this point? Well, there's a, a couple of concerns. Over the last couple of we've, weeks, we've seen a, a few of our contracts, export contracts, canceled. Um, there's, there's a couple of things driving that. Uh, first and foremost is a stronger dollar, um, which makes our cotton more expensive, plus just higher cotton prices overall, um, I, I think, are what, what have driven these, these cancellations. But I understand uh, from commentaries that China is still expected to buy maybe even more cotton this year from us? Absolutely. And, and when we look at the, the pace of exports, we're actually ahead of where we were a year ago and ahead of what USDA was projecting this year. So cotton exports are still staying strong. And China has always been a, a major customer. Um, and they're shifting some acreage away from cotton right now. I think they're trying to grow some more grain 
and more feed products rather than, than clothing. Uh, but at the same time, they still have their mills open and they're running those mills strong. And, and that's a huge industry in, in China. So uh, it looks like the exports there are still going to stay strong. And as you mentioned, it looks like they definitely are, to some extent, reducing their own cotton acreage. They are, and it looks like they're going to grow, be growing more grains rather than cotton. And so that's going to make them more reliant on other countries such as us um, to, to actually get their, their cotton. Well, between now and the June 30th acreage report from USDA, what does the market look like for December contracts? Well, there's, there's several things we need to kind of be watching uh, between now and then. Um, probably the biggest thing is, is exports and what does China do, what does some of our other, other customers do. Uh, the other thing is their growing conditions. What does, what, does they, what does the weather look like here in the southeast as well as in Texas? And those things are going to drive those markets between now and the end of June. We move from cotton to forestry products now where there may be some fear in the industry following a 16 percent budget cut for the Mississippi Forestry Commission. Starting July 1, there will be 75 fewer employees, most of them employees who consult forest landowners and fight fires. The MFC is also consolidating and reorganizing its service districts around the state. Well, let's stop back by the trivia board to wrap things up as we kick off the month of June. Again, we wanted to know where did the oldest organized garden club in America start? Well, the oldest organized garden club did not start in Mississippi. It is said to have started in Athens, Georgia in 1891. The answer this week is B. Mississippi is considered the nation's sweet potato capital. The crop contributes about $82 million to the state's economic value. Unfortunately, about 30% of potatoes are discarded at harvest, but that doesn't mean they're unusable. With that idea in mind, Mississippi State University Extension created the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. As Farm Week's Amy Myers tells us, the challenge gives MSU students a chance to invent a sweet potato product using the discarded spuds that otherwise might not make it to market. We've all heard the saying, one man's trash, another man's treasure. And that could especially be true for Mississippi State University students in the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. MSU Extension Assistant Professor Dr. Jason Ward explains the goal of the challenge. Produce you buy with your eyes first. And so a lot of times there's some of that product that some of those sweet potatoes that maybe aren't as pretty as some other ones you would find in, at the supermarket. So. Our goal was to try to create a project that could use those roots that maybe aren't the prettiest, that still have the same value, and to make really innovative value-added products from those roots that may otherwise not have a home. Maybe they had some insect damage, uh, maybe they are misshapen, or maybe they got broken during harvest. We partner with CASEL, the Center for the Advancement of Service Learning. Through Castle, we get the Sweet Potato Challenge into classrooms. Ward says the challenge is integrated into a wide range of existing college classes at MSU, such as food science, agricultural information sciences, business, chemical engineering, and even fashion design. It's a microbial leather team, so they're actually able to grow a leather substitute based on processing these sweet potatoes into a sugar to feed some of the microbes that grow that leather alternative. Ward says the challenge is a competition, awarding monetary investments to teams whose products show the most potential. At the beginning, each team pitches their idea to a panel of experts, similar to the hit show Shark Tank. If it's good enough, the panel will invest money for product development. The team spends the next several weeks creating and tweaking products, then reports back to the panel for a chance at more investments. This year, funding came from MSU Extension Seed Grant and USDA Higher Education Grant. MSU students Riley Hanby, Haley Bell, and Candace Killebrew developed a sweet potato-based cattle feed they named Bovine Batatas. The team says learning how to develop their own product offers unique challenges and lessons for the future. We kind of spoke with a couple different um, plant managers um, in, in different areas and found out what all um, usually goes in a feed, why it's put into a feed, and then from there we just kind of took all the information that we had learned and 
mixed it together to make our feed. We made our pellet at the USDA Service Center in Starkville and um, the process that we did was um, we had to grind up some of our, our whole ingredients and then we put them in a mixer to make sure that the pellets would be uniform and then they had a small scale pellet mill um, in their facility that they were willing to let us use to, to make a trial run of our feed. You drop it in the hopper at the top and it goes through several augers to get to um, the actual dye that cuts the pellets. Coming into this, I kind of thought it was going to be a, not a quick process, but kind of easy going. Um, and when we took it to the mill to get it pelletized, uh, when we put the uh, mash in there that we created using dried sweet potatoes, it was just too fluffy and the sweet potato had a lot of starch in it. So it just basically gummed up and I really didn't see that coming. I didn't really expect it, but um, that's okay. We just learned from it and went on to the drawing board and made it better. Use it as a learning experience. So far we've done three presentations and this is our third one. So we're still, we're still working on whether or not if we're going to get investors from this presentation. But as of right now, we've gotten two different sets of amount of money from investors from the presentations that we've done. They brought in judges throughout the sweet potato industry and other professionals throughout campus. That way they can give you um, feedback on your product and try to ask you questions that maybe you wouldn't think about when you're creating it and trying to see if you're actually serious about creating a business and seeing how far this will actually go. We want to get out on the market hopefully next year sometime. We also want to venture out to dairy cattle and swine and also maybe even poultry in the future. If we can make an impact in the agriculture world, that's what it's really all about because that's what we're all, all three of us are passionate about. We're trying to help not only make a use for something that's being wasted, but also help um, the sweet potato farmers benefit from this and not just losing money. We're trying to make it a cheaper feed, so you might pay about as much as you would normally for a feed, but you're gonna, our goal is to feed less of it, therefore you're saving money in the long run. This has really helped me understand the importance of all of this just because um, our lives basically stem from agriculture and production, and um, without the farmers, we won't be able to survive and sustain. So it really uh, makes me feel happy that I have an opportunity to kind of help benefit that. Riley Hanby says the team is grateful to MSU Extension specialists, researchers, and educators for helping turn their idea into a potential business. This process um, has definitely opened my eyes to what Extension can do for, for just the average person. Um, being a student, you, you sometimes get pigeonholed into the class mindset, um, but this project and this challenge uh, allowed us to expand our capabilities. Um, we were able to speak with um, individuals that, that know what they're talking about and know what they're doing and um, they were more than willing to answer anything that we needed to help us in any way that we can and so we're definitely grateful for the opportunity to, to make this product as well as the opportunity to work with them. With about 30 percent of sweet potatoes being discarded from the millions of pounds harvested each year, Dr. Ward emphasizes that generating profit from cold sweet potatoes could be life-changing for many people. These really are family farms and they're delivering value and we've seen that uh, the sweet potato industry utilizes a lot of labor and so for every kind of uh, every dollar that they make at retail a lot of that comes back into local communities through a lot of different pathways so whether that's in the fields you know during harvest season or in packing and those kinds of operations uh, it's a pretty broad ranging market if successful companies are indeed born dr ward hopes they'll eventually return and reinvest in the sweet potato challenge being a superfood packed with vitamins, fiber, and micronutrients not found in other foods, the sweet potato could be a source for many product ideas still waiting to be discovered. I'm Amy Myers reporting. Hey, and Layden, how about this? Since Amy filed that story, there's been another sweet potato challenge. We've got some pictures. We'll show you some of these uh, winners in these pictures right now. This first photo that we've got, they're the winners, sweet printing 3D filament. They came in first place. Second place was spudhesive. That's right, glue from sweet potatoes. Spudhesive, that's what I call a sticky situation. Oh man, next up uh, we have Sweet Shades Makeup, something for the lady in your life. Look nice there, nice looking makeup too. Finally, we add sweet ink, so the next time you do calligraphy, you can use sweet potatoes. And we also had microbial sweet potato leather. 
All right, I love it. Some really cool, really creative ideas with those uh, sweet potato contest entries. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's show, but good one in store next week. That's right. With the recent flooding along the Mississippi, it got us to thinking, are you prepared? Well, MSU Extension is here to help. In part one of a two-part series, we'll examine what Extension does to educate people on how to protect family, pets, livestock, and property when natural and man-made disasters occur. Looking forward to that. Plus, you've got that big, beautiful garden. Make it better by adding in some butterflies. We'll tell you the types of flowers you'll want to plant to make your garden a haven for all those fluttering friends out there. And meet two sisters who credit 4-H with putting them on the path to careers as veterinarians. Hear their story and how their journey through the College of Veterinary Medicine is going. All right, thanks so much for joining us this week. I'm Troy Moling. And I'm Leighton Spann. Remember, if you missed a story, you can find past episodes of, of Farm Week under the Shows tab on our website. That's extension.msstate.edu. Oh, yeah, check that out. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Join in on the conversation right now on Facebook. We have some more information about the new TCALP program we told you about last on last week's show, so we definitely recommend checking that out. That's going to do it for us. We'll see you right here next week.